Hi, my name is Samantha Boss, and I'm with the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm here with Project STARE today to talk about fluency reasoning strategies. So first, let's talk about some fluency fundamentals. When students are able to quickly and easily recall math facts, this allows them to focus on more advanced math topics without having to spend energy solving basic recall facts. Students with mathematical difficulties may require explicit instruction in learning math facts, and they should receive brief but daily or near daily opportunities to practice their math facts. When teaching math facts, it is beneficial to work on counting strategies, then reasoning strategies, and finally mastery practice. And today we're gonna to be spending time right here on reasoning strategies. So let's first start with addition. So when we're talking about addition strategies, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get my marker out and I'm gonna show you examples of each of these strategies. The first one we're gonna talk about is called one more and two more then, or this idea of counting on. So for example, I'm gonna teach students and some students again may require this as explicit instruction, that when I add on one more number, it's the next number on the number line. Three plus one equals four, four plus one equals five, five plus one equals six, um, really thinking through how we're just counting on. Additionally, you might wanna teach uh, adding two more. So three plus two equals five, four plus two equals six, five plus two equals seven, really making those very fast facts for students. Another strategy that might need to be taught explicitly to students is this idea that when I add zero, the value of my first add-in doesn't change. Any number plus zero is itself. And then the next strategy we wanna teach is thinking about what are our doubles. We want students to see doubles and automatically just know I can multiply by two and I get the answer. Three plus three equals six. Six plus six equals 12. 8 plus 8 equals 16. These are some really key addition facts that will benefit students down the line if they can sort of identify those quickly. The next couple strategies we're gonna talk about are a little bit more advanced, but they're really focused on this idea of 10 as a benchmark number. So for example, my first step is to teach students what combinations of numbers make 10. So for example, I have uh, six plus four equals 10. I have three plus seven equals 10. I have eight plus two, nine plus one, five plus five. I really want to um, practice with them what number combinations can I make so that my sum is 10. We're really gonna be spending a lot of time focused on 10 as our benchmark number because then when we come down here where we're making groups of 10, it can be really beneficial if students have those um, math facts set in their head. So when I get to maybe a little bit more advanced problems such as six plus eight, you know, this might be challenging for some students, but if I know my combinations of 10, I might say to myself, well, hey, I can break that six into four and two and now I have four and two plus eight. Well, hey, looky there. I've got eight and two and I know that equals 10. So now I have four plus 10. And that might be a lot easier for me to see and to solve four plus 10 rather than six plus eight. And I hope I'm not scaring you with all this writing. It is pretty obvious that this is gonna take some work for students to become fluent in being able to decompose numbers and sort of uh, rearrange them to make these uh, groups of 10. However, it is so beneficial if students have this deep number sense, um, and that's why it's really key that we're teaching these strategies even when students are younger. How do they identify 10? How do they make groups of 10? And then how can we think about decomposing other numbers to make groups of 10? The next strategy is similar, um, but instead of 10, we're gonna use five as our anchor. So for example, if I have a problem such as seven plus six, well, I'm gonna think about how these numbers relate to five. So I'm gonna say to myself, I know seven is the same as two and five, and I know that six is the same as one and five. 
So now I can think about this problem as 2 plus 1 plus 5 plus 5. And hey, look at there. I know 5 and 5 is 10. So now I just have to solve 2 plus 1 plus 10. And that one, I can almost just count up. And I can say 10, 11, 12, 13. So again, I know this looks like a lot more work um, and it will take time to teach this to students and make sure that they're fluent in understanding how they can break up numbers. But I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for students to be able to start seeing these relationships. It'll really be worth um, the time down the road. And then the last strategy, which can be a little bit more, a little more challenging, which is why we left it till the end, is thinking about numbers in terms of near doubles. So I know from before that four and four make eight. Four is a double that I can, I can double four and make eight. But now what happens if I see maybe four plus five? Well, I'm gonna think about my four plus four and know that four plus five is the same as four plus four plus one. And remember from back here, my four plus four is eight and then I'm just adding one more. And now I have eight plus one equals nine. Again, it looks like a lot of writing, but as students become more flexible in their thinking, this will move along a little bit faster. So when we're thinking about subtraction strategies, one of the key things that we really want to recognize and acknowledge is that it's easier for students to add many times than it is for them to subtract. So if students are struggling with their subtraction strategies or their subtraction facts, the first thing we can do is turn it into an addition problem. So for example, instead of saying what is 13 minus 8, you know, I'm going to turn that into 8 plus what is 13. And this might be easier for students to see in terms of 8 plus 5 equals 13, rather than for them to think 13 minus 8 equals 5. Um, even though it seems like a small difference, changing it into an addition problem can be really beneficial for a lot of students who otherwise struggle. And now remember on the previous slide, we emphasized so much the 10 as a benchmark. We're going to do the same thing when we're talking about subtraction. So our first strategy is thinking about down under 10. And in this regard, I'm going to use the same problem, 13 minus 8. We're really trying to use 10 as our benchmark. So for example, I know that 13 is greater than 10. So I'm going to think about 13 minus 10 equals what? Sort of using that as my first benchmark. And then once I've gotten to 10, what's my distance from 10 to my 8? Well, 10 minus 8 is 2. And then I'm going to add these two together to get my total difference between 13 and 8. And if this is confusing for students, um, what can be very beneficial is using a number line for this strategy. So for example, jumping from 13 to 10, and then 10 to 8, oh, that total difference was 5. And then in a similar way, thinking about taking from 10, we're again going to use our 10 as our benchmark. And I'm going to reframe this problem instead of 13 minus 8. I'm going to think about what's my distance between 10 and these numbers. So I'm going to think about 13 is the same as 10 plus 3. And I'm going to think about 10 minus 8 equals 2. And again, I'm left with this um, addition problem, sorry that got kind of squeaky, where I'm thinking about the difference then between 13 to 8 is 5. So again, number lines can be very beneficial when we use 10 as a benchmark, thinking about what is my relationship to 10. I'm going to erase this board and then we'll come back with some multiplication strategies. Okay, so let's talk multiplication strategies. The first thing to think about when students are learning their multiplication math facts is what are some of our key math facts that they need to learn first? What are really those um, maybe easier to understand or those benchmark math facts that are gonna help them down the line? So the foundational math facts that we really wanna focus on 
is we want to focus on um, our skip counting by two, or this goes really back to those doubles. We really want to focus on five, multiplying by 10, multiplying by zero, and multiplying by one. And if we can get students to understand, for example, any number multiplied by itself is that same number, any number multiplied by zero is zero, any number multiplied by 10 is going to be that same number with a zero behind it, that's really going to give them a strong foundation for the rest of these strategies. So when we think about our nines, oftentimes this has to be um, explicitly taught how to uh, sort of remember our nine facts. And what can be very beneficial, instead of just teaching tricks or just um, sort of forcing students to memorize their nine facts, have them think about their nine facts as 10 times that number minus one times that number. So for example, if I have nine times five, it's really helpful for me to see this instead as maybe 10 times five minus one times five, excuse me. And since I already know my 10 facts and my five facts, it's pretty easy for me to say that 10 times five is 50, and I know that one times five is five. So then uh, nine times five is gonna be the same as 50 minus five or 45. And again, even though this seems like a lot to write out, if students can start thinking about any number times nine is just that number times 10, minus the number itself, that really helps them build that number sense and that ability to really think through number relationships and manipulate those numbers. The next strategy we're gonna talk about is adding of subtracting a group. So let me show you what I mean by this. So if I have six times four, move a little higher, six times four, maybe this is a problem I'm not as familiar with. Um, so instead, I'm gonna try and break it up to think about this as five times four plus one remainder four. So I'm really just uh, taking away one value so that six becomes a five, and then I'm adding that number back. So this might be a lot easier for me to see that six times four is the same as five plus four plus four, um, and I know that five times four is 20, plus four is 24. So again, we're just trying to think about how can we make these numbers more friendly and easier for students to understand. When I'm thinking about my doubling and halving, um, this is gonna be really important that students have a strong foundation of multiplying by two, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask them down here to really understand those relationships of doubles and halves. So for example, if I have a problem, let's say six times eight, maybe I don't know that math fact yet, but maybe I do know three times eight, and I know that three times two equals six. So maybe this is easier for me to figure out and to see, because I know my twos, I know I can double things pretty easily, and I know uh, three times eight. So let's say I know three times eight is 24. It's actually pretty easy to double 24 to get 48. But thinking through how can I break problems down, knowing that relationship uh, to, of my doubles and my relationship to two. And then my final strategy is sort of combining these all together, thinking about how I can just break uh, math facts apart to make them friendly for me. So let's say eight times six. Let's say again, this is a problem I'm less familiar with, but I know five times six and I know three times six, and I know since I can break these apart, you know, eight is the same as five plus three, so five times six is gonna be 30, I wanna make sure I don't run off the bottom of the board, and three times six is gonna be 18, and I add those together to get 48. So I'm really just using all the math strategies that we've learned so far in terms of um, learning our different multiplication facts, being able to decompose those into numbers that I'm more familiar with. And again, this is all about building that reasoning skill, um, that ability for students to manipulate numbers to create friendlier numbers for them. I'm gonna erase this slide and then we're gonna talk about some division strategies.
Okay, and last but not least, we're gonna talk about some division strategies. Now remember before when we were talking about subtraction, I said that it's easier for students to add than it is for them to subtract. The same thing often happens when we're talking about uh, division. So instead of thinking division facts, let's turn these into multiplication facts. Because again, division and multiplication are inverse operations, so we can really manipulate the numbers this way. So let's say I had a problem such as 36 divided by 4 equals something. This might be, stra this might be challenging for some students. It might be easier for them to instead see this problem as 4 times what equals 36 and really think about those multiplication strategies that we've been working on. <clears throat> the last thing that we want to talk about is practicing near division facts. So again, even though this seems like more work up front now, this can be very beneficial for students to start thinking about uh, division problems where the answer is not a whole number. So hopefully they're starting to learn that 48 divided by 6 equals 8. But when presented with numbers like this, where the answer isn't going to be a whole number, it's important for students to start thinking about, well, what do I do here? How do I show answers that aren't whole numbers? Um, so even though, again, this is asking more of you now, <clears throat> building this number sense is going to be so beneficial when students are faced with rational numbers down the line. I'm going to erase this slide, and then we're going to turn to our um, wrap up. Thanks for watching the Stair Taylor video on fluency reasoning strategies. Be sure to subscribe and check out our YouTube channel for more great videos. We even have another video on fluency mastery strategies. Thanks, and I hope to see you again soon.